So I've been wanting to make this video for a good while now, and it's basically going to be talking about the Nordic model and mainly the problems with the Nordic model and where people who advocate for the Nordic model being the end goal of economic and social reform, where the problems often lie with how these countries can even exist in the first place in the state they do exist. Now, prominent people that you often hear talk about this, David Pakman is one of the more popular online commentators I've heard before talking about, you know, he considers himself this sort of like sock dem in like the Scandinavian tradition. So obviously idolizing the societies of, you know, in my mind, Sweden, Denmark and Norway, and perhaps even Finland as well. But for the purpose of this video, I'm going to be sticking to Sweden, Norway and Denmark. But like with a lot of political analysis generally, I think people miss the general point about capitalism. Like capitalism, of course, exists in its own forms in various different nation states. But what people often miss is that global capitalism is still taken advantage of by even the Nordic countries. And they are wealthy because of global capitalism, a system that they participate in and actually engage in imperialist wars to uphold this system, which has been dominated by the United States since the end of the Second World War. Of course, many other big countries exist in it, but the US still dominates. So today what I wanna to talk about is people's perceptions of the Nordic model and about it being like this goal to strive for and the end goal essentially for some people. And then I wanna talk about how these countries can only exist because they partner up with the US to participate in global capitalism, which is fundamentally in my mind, an extension of the European colonial period because the exploitation of global capitalism done in that era was done by European state backed companies. And to become a part of this system, you had to partner up with countries like the US. You had to join things like NATO to get into their good graces. And you will see how these countries often act as like mercenary forces for the US's own foreign policy goals just to appease them because there's no way someone in Denmark or Norway can justify fighting in wars in the Middle East because of national security. So we're gonna get into all of that in the video and just for the next minute, I'm gonna plug my socials. If you don't care about that stuff, please skip forward. There should be timestamps in the description. Before we get any further, a lot of my work on this channel is demonetized because when you're covering more serious, sometimes edgier topics, YouTube doesn't like this. So if you've ever enjoyed my work, please consider becoming a patron. And you don't have to pledge a crazy amount. I want to build up my Patreon based on as many people as possible pledging little amounts, like a dollar or two. So if you know you feel like I have ever brought anything that's worthwhile into your life and my content, please really consider becoming a patron to help me continue to do this, regardless of if YouTube monetize or not most of my videos in a given month. Also, if you want to join our communities, come check out our Discord and my subreddit. Those links in the description. And if you want to follow me personally, please check out the Cavernacle at Twitter, at Instagram, and also my personal Reddit where you can keep up to date with all my content and what I'm doing. So first off, I want to play you some YouTube clips of people talking about like how great the Nordic model is and people who think that should be like the end goal. So I'm gonna talk about the Young Turks, who I pretty much like, and David Pakman, who I don't like as much, but a lot of you guys seem to like him. I've made a whole video criticizing him, but here they are talking about the benefits of the Nordic model and David Pakman himself describing himself as someone who does advocate for this system as like an end goal. Study indicates that America sucks and uh, Norway rocks. Okay, this is a UN report <laughs> and what they did is they looked at the quality of life of 155 countries and they realized mm, America's not number one. In fact, it's number 14. But at number one is Norway, which did unseat Denwa Denmark as the world's happiest country. Now, the Nordic nations are the most content, according to the World Happiness Report uh, in 2017, produced by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, a global initiative launched by the UN in 2012. So countries in sub-Saharan Africa, along with Syria and Yemen, are the least happy of the one 155 countries ranked. Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland, Finland, Netherlands, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and Sweden rounded up the top 10 countries. So those are the happiest places on earth. Well, I do see one thing that unites them, socialism. Uh, but we are told that socialism is the boogeyman. It might actually make you happy. 
Now, I've said this a thousand times on the show. I'm a capitalist, I'm a small business owner, I believe in competition. But apparently, they're doing something right in the socialist countries. So their rate of taxation in those countries are astronomical. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as an American, find them to be too high. Um, but they're obviously doing something right. And unlike ideologues, I look at that and go, well, that is data. That mm -hmm. Those are facts, those are interesting things to think about. So perhaps, I'm not saying we need to do exactly what they do and that everything they do is applicable to us, but perhaps we could learn a lesson or two from them. So there is a way to do a proper balancing act here. We're not talking about communism here. And yeah. apparently- You need a mixed economy, man. You gotta mix that economy up. And every economy is mixed. Yeah. Our economy is mixed. What's your position, David? And I've mentioned before that I'm not a socialist. I'm a social democrat in the sort of Nordic or Swedish tradition. And today I'm gonna explain to you why I am not a socialist. And I'm happy to do this. It's something that's been an area of study for me since undergraduate and even even including in graduate school. On the one hand, where socialism wants to level out the distribution in a way that I've not seen evidence can actually be achieved without significant downsides, what social democracy wants to do is tweak that distribution, lower the uh, 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 absolute top, raise the bottom a little bit, and then reduce the gap between the very bottom and the very top. You're sort of leveling it out. You're raising the mean and reducing the difference between top and bottom. I think it's important to look at Sweden as an example. The right hates looking at Sweden. Sweden's social democratic party, which I identify with, was built on five principles that will sound really familiar to social Democrats. That's part of why I believe that total socialism actually is not the path forward, but that there are socializable components which would work absolutely fine in the United States. So just to end with David's point there, talking about kind of like closing the wealth gap, but still in essence keeping this capitalist hierarchy, I think outlines a lot of my problems immediately with Nordic systems and you know they're not socialist systems they're like this kind of like mixed economy which is still very capitalist now you've heard like the young turks praise them and i just want to say you know before we get started into my criticisms of the nordic model and how it can exist i'm going to say right now i would swap the models of norway sweden or denmark for the model we have in the uk in a second and i totally am happy to admit there is nothing wrong with wanting your country, especially if it's a Western capitalist country, to transition into something like the Nordic model, where there is a bigger welfare state, where there is, you know, more taxes, but the benefits of your taxes are there to be seen instead of being wasted, like the military industrial complex, and just generally stuff that your taxes don't need to be spent on, but they are spent on while the stuff you actually use, like for example in the UK, the NHS, is constantly cut and underfunded, where we spend the second biggest amount of money in NATO just behind the US, 40 billion a year. And also everything that's been happening under the Johnson government is just a total joke with how much government contracts have been given out to people who don't make things like PPE, for example, and they're just mates of Tories and they're Tory donors. There's clearly a lot of money to go around and even if we have to pay more taxes on top of that, it would be nice for the tax money we pay to be reflected in the system we live in, instead of having you know, these brutal systems of austerity that are awful, especially for you know poor minorities and refugees, but just generally for everyone. You know, anyone will tell you in the UK that although you know the NHS is great and stuff and it's free, if you want to go see your GP and you want to be referred for something. It will take a long time and it's clear it's getting worse and worse by the year by a very, very pro big business capitalist government. So I'm not saying if you want to move from the US to Denmark or Norway or Sweden for a better quality of life, I'm not saying that's not a true thing. They obviously do have a better quality of life. Most studies show that they do. And it is thanks to this Nordic model. I'm just not going to debate that because the facts show it's better. So we'll get into that for the first story. So a good article on the Jacobin. Uh, by Andreas Muller Molvad said the real Denmark. The article does a good job at also just going into the general things that these countries do well. So I want to give credit to these countries because these systems are better than the systems we have 
in the US and the UK. So what Denmark does show that there is no economic barriers to high taxation, high social spending and high unionization. Social democracy, contrary to Reagan and other right-wing ideologues, does not yield mass unemployment or economic ruin. It's yielded some of the highest standards of living and freest countries the world has ever seen. Poverty and inequality are relatively low. Gender equality is comparatively high and workers have more rights and say on the job than in the US. Denmark is not unique. Each of the Scandinavian countries has attained similar levels of social equality despite having quite different economies. While Sweden has always been dominated by mining and heavy industry, Denmark has relied on agriculture and smaller industrial firms. Norway has been fishing and timber heavy and so on. Despite these different economic profiles over the course of the 20th century, all of the Nordics managed to drastically reduce wage inequality, decommodify substantial parts of the economy. The key was unions, popular movements and left parties. It was these mass forces, not benevolent elites, and kept carefully weighing the alternatives before deciding on an enlightened mix of capitalism and socialism, who were the architects and impetus behind the Nordic model. They are the ones responsible for making the Nordic countries among the happiest and most democratic in the world. But just the article going into like my criticisms and just starting off the bad parts about it, but neither Denmark nor the Scandinavian countries have been immune to the wave of neoliberal reforms in recent decades with state cutbacks, pension reductions and financial liberalisation. In some areas, the Nordics have been seen as forerunners. Sweden led the world in school privatisation and now has a for-profit education industry that attracts plaudits from right-wingers across the globe, even the UK, for example. Recent pension reforms in Denmark will raise the retirement age to the highest in Europe. And in 2014, the country sold parts of its national energy company to Goldman Sachs. According to the OECD, Scandinavia has experienced some of the sharpest increases in inequality in recent decades. So most countries aren't utopias. The Nordic countries are not utopias. Despite having stronger unions, better workers' rights, taxes that actually go to stuff that people use rather than never-ending wars, it is clear these countries still have problems. So now I want to shift to the negative side. So like I said at the start of the video, the Nordic countries and their high standards of living and all the rest of it can only be achieved thanks to the wealth of these countries. And how do these countries stay wealthy? Well, they are benefiting from the same exploitative global capitalist system that the rest of the primarily Western nations benefit from the most. Of course, you have China, you have India, you have more emerging economies with the BRICS who are coming into this system. But it's pretty fair to say that global capitalism was mostly spread by European colonialists and that legacy hasn't gone away. So there's always been pretty strong ties between a lot of these countries with the royal families of you know, Denmark and Britain, for example. But also post-World War II is when these countries became far closer. So countries like Sweden, of course, were neutral. So their economy had a massive boom after the war where a lot of these other ones were aligned with the allies. And because of these close ties to the United States and NATO members, these guys benefit off the system these NATO members created, especially the ones that go further back to the European colonial period, like France and Britain, for example. So while Sweden is not really known for like having a great military, for example, or participating a lot in foreign wars, even going back to the Second World War, what Sweden is known for is its massive arms industry. Now, its arms industry also sells a lot of these arms to Western-aligned dictators in places like the Middle East, for example. So keep this in mind when you're thinking about like how Nordic models can thrive and survive. It's because they're generating a lot of their wealth, especially the governments of these countries, because they're in bed with these corporations that are often, you know, at least owned partly by the state, and they're doing deals which can only be enabled by Western capitalism. So Sweden's dirty secret, says insiders, it's arms dictators. So alongside a global reputation for peacemaking and generous foreign aid, Sweden has become a major world supplier of weapons, counting a number of regimes criticized for human rights abuses among its customers. Ranked the third largest arms exporter per capita after Israel and Russia, Sweden's booming industry has stirred up ethical concerns among Swedes about some countries it is doing business with. 
In a hangar in the heart of Sweden's military industrial complex, Saab technicians are building an assembly line for the next generation of Gripen fighters equipped with state-of-the-art warfare systems and larger weapon bays. Saab and other Sweden-based firms, including BAA Systems and Bofors, have been hugely successful in the 2000s last year alone, selling weapons and defense material to 55 countries to the tune of $1.8 billion. But critics charge that Sweden has become more inclined to arm regimes accused of human rights abuses, including Saudi Arabia, UAE and Pakistan, as demand from Western nations has declined since the Cold War ended. Arming dictators, Swedes see themselves as very ethical and restrictive when it comes to giving human rights violators or dictators things that help them stay in power. But reality is that has happened, said Simon Vesman, an arms expert at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. In the last decade or so, they've been more open to it because those are the markets. In the past, they wouldn't have done business with Saudi Arabia due to human rights concerns. It's obviously a place that rings all kinds of alarm bells, but that has changed. They've sold them radar tracking systems and anti-tank missiles and marketed other weapons there. In 2012, Swedish public radio revealed that the National Defense Research Agency had provided Saudi Arabia with covert technical support for a missile factory leading to the resignation of a defense minister and the launch of an inquiry into a new ethical criteria for weapon sales. Peace activist Martin Smedjabak said Sweden's original reasoning for developing a large weapons industry, the desire to be self-sufficient and independent, has vanished along with the country's policy of neutrality as it develops closer ties to NATO. Holt believes at times Swedish foreign policy becomes entwined with commercial arms export interests, citing the example of Sweden's participation in enforcing a NATO no-fly zone over Libya in 2011. Our participation in the Libya campaign was quite beneficial to the Gripen. This is something no politician would ever admit, but it's true. People saw it participating in air campaigns and it's good for business. So we're gonna get back to Libya because Norway also plays a very vital role in the overthrow of Gaddafi. But just getting a bit more onto the ties between the arms industry and the government, because as we already saw, the government were actually helping the Saudis develop um, missile factory. So a Politico article about the same issue in 2015 was saying that um, Sweden's arms exports feature many distinctly murky practices. During Sweden's campaign trying to sell Gripen to Switzerland last spring, Sweden used design rock concerts and a royal visit to help create a positive image of Sweden and the Gripen, notes Anna Ek, president of the Swedish Peace and Arbitration Society. The government's involvement distinguishes the arms trade from other trades and yet the arms company's profits benefit mostly them, not the government. So there I'm just showing you that the government of Sweden and these corporations from Sweden, which aren't very distinguishable from like US corporations or British corporations, do use the framework of Western global capitalism to sell these arms around the world to oppressive dictators like the Saudis. So these countries aren't perfect. Like I said, they are better than the UK and the US, but they have very similar problems in a lot of ways. And Sweden is one of the more notable ones. And, and despite not normally engaging in outright Western imperialism through military action, it still kind of did it to advertise its new grip and fighter and it's still happy enough to arm all the client states of the West, along with you know the United States, of course. But Denmark and Norway being in NATO means they've directly participated in Western imperialism, which often is very intertwined with Western capitalism. So Denmark is quite notable for fighting in both Afghanistan and more importantly, Iraq. And like I said at the start, there's no real reason it had to do these things, especially with Iraq. A lot of NATO members didn't fight in the Iraq war, but Denmark did. And it also fought in Afghanistan. And it kind of reminds me of the situation with like South Korea and the Vietnam War and negotiations between like Nixon and the president of South Korea. And he's basically like, you know, if you don't fight for me in Vietnam, then I'm just gonna you know, pull out troops out of South Korea. And it's kind of like, I feel it's a similar vibe with the Danes because it's like, why are you doing this? Like, why are you fighting in these Middle Eastern wars along with the UK and the US? You're just going along. It feels like you're just the mercenary force, essentially. And you're doing it to appease the Americans who have a big influence on the global economy. And that's how you kind of get your own influence in. So the Danes were in Afghanistan and they were even in Helmand province, which was a quite a volatile area, very famous in the UK, because that's where Britain faced some of its worst casualties. So Denmark were there. It's not like this real, real peaceful zone. They were training troops and actually engaging in the war itself. There's actually a couple of Danish films that have come out about it which caused a massive uproar in Denmark because 
it raised a lot of questions because the public were essentially being sold that the Danes were there to like build houses and train the local forces and it came out that they were actually fighting and pretty brutal conditions sometimes, people were annoyed. So talking more about the Danes' role in Western imperialism and just, you know, Western anti-communism, an article by the Foreign Policy Research Institute said, through thick and thin, Danish military forces have contributed to all major US-led wars and interventions since 1991. Recently, the US has asked Denmark to contribute to the US-led forces in Syria. A newly independent inquiry into Denmark's military engagements commissioned by the Danish parliament concludes that Denmark's military engagements in the Middle East have had little to do with any direct threats to Danish national security. Rather, they are results of shifting government's eagerness to respond to US demands and proving Denmark's usefulness. Denmark is a super Atlanticist, meaning that it will unequivocally support US policies and its role in the world, and is willing to pursue even costly and risky policies to maintain its special relationship with the US. To grasp just how influential the US is on Danish foreign and security policy, it may be useful to compare it to the Cold War period, Denmark was not always a stalwart support of US actions and interventions. Denmark was not very preoccupied with the Middle East, but was mainly worried about Russia and Eastern Europe. But now, not only have Danish governments followed the US, but they've also participated in these riskier military operations. In Afghanistan, Danish forces were located in Helmand, where they endured casualties that compare with the US in relative terms. In the Libyan intervention against Gaddafi, Denmark was one of the first countries to send ground personnel and hit 17% of all targets from the air. And in the Iraq war, Denmark sided with the US when other countries in Europe did not. Still today, Denmark has soldiers stationed with US troops on the Al-Assad base in the unruly Anbar province in Iraq, helping to train Iraqi soldiers. Although the Danish public has grown increasingly wary of seemingly endless interventions, Danish governments continue to make military contributions to US missions in the Middle East almost by default. So there you see Denmark is clearly one of the more fervent US supporters and like it said in the article, it's not about national security. So if it's not about national security, what is it about? And it's because of many different things, but one thing being the US's position in the global capitalist economy being the dominant one, being the ones who pull the strings and things like the IMF and World Bank, being the ones who have all this influence, American companies' influence, or American political influence on many regions and countries around the world, including Saudi Arabia and various dictatorships in the Gulf region where there is a lot of new money to be had for people who sell weapons, among other things. But Norway is another country that has participated in this, so Norway's ill advised on the bombing of Libya. This conclusion came after the commission, led by a former foreign minister for the Conservative Party, Jan Peterson, studied the national processes that led to the Stoltenberg government's decision to join the NATO operation. The decision was backed by a majority in Parliament, and Norwegian fighter jet pilots played an active role in the bombings that led to the downfall of Gaddafi. Morten Boas, a senior researcher at the Norwegian Foreign Policy Institute, told Norwegian newspapers, the story of Libya is a story of mistaken intervention, and Norwegian officials have to accept that even though it's hard. He notes that the government and members of Parliament accepted that the US's claims that Gaddafi was trying to kill demonstrators. The bombings were based on the idea that if they only get rid of Gaddafi, everything would be fine, but no one had a plan for what should happen after Gaddafi fell. Now, Norway actually has a couple prominent oil companies. One of them has actually been working in Libya since 2005, so it's quite curious they would participate in this campaign. Could it be that the oil fields that they were working on might be threatened? So Equinor is the company working in Libya, and on their page it says, Equinor has been present in Libya for 25 years with onshore exploration and oil production activities. We now participate in licenses on the Mabruk field and in the Murzuk Basin. Libya has long been a major exporter of oil and gas, but the industry has been badly affected by political and security challenges in the country since the revolution in 2011. The Mabruk field has been shut down since 2015, but production in the Murzuk has resumed in the beginning of 2017. So it's pretty clear that there is a contrast with Norwegian or Danish or Swedish society and the welfare programs and their foreign policy, which if not, in lockstep with the US, like the Danish, it is sympathetic to the US, like the Norwegians, or it just kind of stays neutral, but kind of supports the NATO position like Sweden is doing now. And of course, like I said before, you're doing this to appease the top economy in the world. And there are so many benefits to tying yourself at the hip with them. Like they said, 
Danish foreign policy doesn't care about the Middle East really, only because the US is there. So one more thing is that there's other things like state-backed companies exploiting Bangladeshi child labor. So this is about um, 13 years ago, but uh, the board of Norwegian telecoms group Telenor backed its chief executive on Tuesday after reports of dangerous job conditions and the use of child labor by subcontractors in Bangladesh. A Danish television documentary last week revealed dangerous working conditions, accidental deaths, pollution, and the use of children at Telenor's subcontractors in Bangladesh, unleashing a flood of criticism in Norwegian media. The documentary said children as young as 13 years old worked at the factories climbing with no safety net in the 50 meters tall antenna towers, it also revealed how a 22-year-old worker died when falling into a non-secured pool of acid and that farmers had their crops ruined by waste from the factories. So that was just the last example. So I'm going to sum this all up right now. So generally in capitalism, there is a group of winners and a group of losers. So you have that in a microcosm in normal nations, right? So in the UK, most people who work for companies are the losers in that you're probably generating the company a lot more money than they're paying you, meaning a lot of your value is just going to shareholders who don't really do anything to earn that money. So most of you are being exploited for your labor. Now this of course even happens in the Nordic countries, but we take that to a global extent and to the global extent it is mainly richer nations constantly exploiting poorer nations so they can't develop to become as economically, I guess, secure or rich as the Western nations. How that often works is that the Western nations, through things like the IMF or the World Bank, help create this oligarchy, which is Western aligned, meaning they can really exploit the national resources of that country. So you saw right there the Norwegian oil company, that's one example, because a lot of those countries in the past have nationalized their resources, and that's a big reason why so many of the leaders have been overthrown. They've been overthrown, so Western companies can come in and privatize the industries and then sell it for their own profits, which does contribute generally to the Western countries' wealth. But this happens across the world. Like most of your clothes are probably made in sweatshops in Ethiopia where they pay the lowest wages in the world. I actually made a video like a couple years ago where I was talking about these women who make clothes for Tommy Hilfiger, but they aren't even paid enough money um, to rent the apartment they all share in like a really bad apartment in bad conditions. So it's basically like a debt trap. It's essentially like slavery for a lot of these people, like straight up slavery. But this is across the world. And the Nordic countries aren't immune to doing this. The Nordic countries, state companies or corporations from the Nordic countries aren't immune to this stuff at all. And that's what my main point is, is that these countries have their wealth and they have the ability to implement these better economic and social reforms because of the wealth that is extracted on the global capitalist economy. And like I said, there's the microcosm and then obviously the macro version, which is the global capitalist exploitation, which is an extension, in my mind, of European colonialism. So it's no surprise a lot of these countries are aligned with the European colonialists like France and Britain. And obviously America pretty much taken the position of the British Empire after the Second World War. And how do you maintain your place on this hierarchy? How do you stay at the top with the winners, the winners in NATO, the winners in the Western economies? Well, for Norway and Denmark, you're pretty much gonna support US imperialism because not only will that probably give you access to things in Iraq maybe for your oil companies, so that's a big thing for Denmark and Norway, or in Libya, where Norway actually have companies that extract the oil from there, or even in Sweden, which maybe give a little bit of help to the Saudi government to make their own missile factories. They're all doing this, one, for money, of course. These guys are still capitalists, despite being in the Nordic model countries, but also because you wanna appease the global hegemon, which is the US. And it gets to my final point. I don't want the Nordic model as the end goal of human society because it only exists based on global capitalist exploitation. And if we are all free and all equal, these countries can't be so above the rest of the world. So in my mind, I want socialism because I want the entire world to be equal. I don't want the Nordic model as the end goal because the Nordic model still means and assumes you're still complicit in Western global capitalism, which is going to enrich you so you can actually implement these models in the first place and have a far better standard of living than pretty much most countries in the entire world. These countries like the US, UK, France, 
in the macro version, they're not rich because they're run better. They're not rich because somehow we've discovered some amazing version of capitalism. They're rich because as a legacy of colonialism, they're still exploiting the very same peoples and countries we have for hundreds of years. Primarily, that is mostly in Africa, but it's also in places in Asia as well. And that's how you have very cheap clothes, very cheap food, things like consumer goods that are very affordable from all over the world in your supermarket, right? But it's facilitated by exploitive Western corporations where the person who makes your clothes, the person who grows your food, the person who makes your computer, they aren't being compensated adequately. They're not even being compensated in a way they would be in your own country, which has exploitive capitalism. They're being paid total garbage wages, often existing their entire lives in these slave conditions, so you have cheap access to these consumer goods, which then you pay for and make a Western corporation, or maybe a Japanese corporation or a Chinese corporation, very, very rich. So in the short term, advocating for more economic and social reforms based on the Nordic model is totally fine. I got no problem with that. But to say that is the end goal and that is what we should all be aiming for, especially in Western countries, I think misses the larger problem that capitalism doesn't have borders. Capitalism is exploiting the entire world. People suffer worse in other countries for sure, but this is something everyone needs to be liberated from. And just, you know, the UK changing to the Nordic model or even the US changing to the Nordic model isn't going to stop global capitalist exploitation. There is still a very strong element that will remain very consistent, even if the top economy in the world, the United States, change completely to a model like Norway, for example. Is it the most realistic option? Maybe people would say that. People like David Pakman, there's a lot of people like him, seem to be saying this is the end goal. And that is something I completely reject because these countries still exist based on a global system of exploitation. Anyway, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. If you want to follow me, follow me on social media at The Kavanagh on Twitter and Instagram. Come and join our communities on Discord and subreddit in the description. And if you want to support my work, check out my Patreon. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.